Welcome to At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. Thank you for joining us. This time, the half-hour conversation will be about zoos. And no, we're not going to visit zoos because they're interesting or they are fun for children. We're going to talk about a very serious issue, and that is the extinction of certain species or the near extinction of certain species. And we're going to have that conversation with Dawn Peatfish. Uh, Dawn is with the Peoria Zoo, where she is the curator of collections. Thank you for joining us on the program. Oh, thank you for having me. And Eric Hanen is here. He is the keeper. <laughs> I, I like that title, the keeper. <laughs> uh, uh, and you're at Miller Park Zoo in Bloomington. Yes. And just for clarification, Miller Park Zoo is part of the city of Bloomington. Correct. And Peoria Zoo is part of the Peoria Park District. Correct. And the first thing we want to talk about is endangered, threatened. I mean, there's various levels. We're familiar with, yeah, there's various levels of these uh, endangered and, and threatened levels. But Eric, what is there a, a layman's definition of this structure so we know the difference? Sure. Uh, I think uh, when we talk about endangered, uh, there's kind of two levels, critically endangered and endangered. And both of those are talking about how close to extinction those species are. So critically endangered means there's very few. They could go extinct at any point uh, just through any sort of accident or um, uh, emergency. A hurricane or something could knock out an entire population. And endangered means that there's very few of them left, um, that they're not uh, in immediate danger of going extinct, but we do need to be very careful. And then there's kind of like least concern and vulnerable, which means that they're in better shape, but everybody, we still need to be concerned about how many individuals are left in all of these populations. We're going to see video of uh, animals, both at Miller Park and at Peoria Zoo, and they are all endangered species. Correct. And why is it important that we have these kinds of programs? If you could explain, in, once again, in lay terms, how this works, why you have endangered species, and what it is you do to try to maintain these animals. Yeah, so as Eric mentioned, um, if an animal is endangered, it's at risk of being extinct. So basically, if we don't have a cooperative effort to save this species, it will go extinct. And so if, if we don't have programs through the zoo or the Association of Zoos and Aquariums or through the government, U.S. Fish and Wildlife or Illinois Department of Resources, we will lose these animals forever. So you don't operate independently. Uh, Dawn mentioned the AZA, the Association of uh, Zoos and Aquariums, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and IDNR. Could you give us an overview of how this coordination works in order to try to save these species? Yeah, well, very briefly that uh, all of the AZA zoos um, have all of their populations in a computer and anybody can look it up at any time <clears throat> and then we coordinate. And if we're looking at a specific species, say giraffes or whatever, um, everybody can know exactly how many giraffes are each individual AZA zoo at any time. And then there's a coordinator for a program, a safe program, and they will um, decide um, which animals need to be moved to be bred or which animals need to be moved so they're not bred so that we maintain this genetic diversity that we're, we will need if we ever reintroduce these animals to the wild. Eric mentioned the SAFE program. Mm -hmm. That's one of several programs that you have to try to uh, save these species. The SAFE program is saving animals from extinction. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a... a yeah, uh, so the amazing thing, this is a relatively new program for AZA. We've had it for a, a few years now. Um, and it was AZA's answer to bringing in partners, whether it be universities or government agencies or um, biologists, and really get their input on what is going on. So if you have a species who is critically endangered and it's endangered because it's being poached, perhaps you need to talk to the law enforcement agency. Um, and all of those things, whether it be 
breeding the species or taking care of the species or um, reducing this wildlife trafficking, all of those people are in the same room at the same time sharing the same information with the same goal. So this collective expertise is just a, it, just a wealth of knowledge and we can develop a plan based on that. And AZA is the organization that, accredit, that gives accreditation to Correct. zoos, and, and not all zoos are accredited. Correct. It's, it's a very rigorous process, and they look at not only your animal care, but every aspect of the zoo, um, your guest services and your finances and your governance, and they want to make sure that all of these uh, accredited zoos are at the very top of the, the game and making sure that the animals in there are treated with the um, utmost concern to their welfare. We were fortunate enough to have an opportunity, uh, Todd Pilon, uh, who's the director of this program, he and I went out to both zoos to get some video and we're going to show you some of the, and all these animals are endangered. And we'll take a look at uh, first the alligator snapping turtle. And if you wanna go ahead and, and explain this to us, Dawn. Sure, so this is an alligator snapping turtle that is in our conservation center at the zoo. That blue dot you saw on his shell is actually nail polish. That's how we identify those alligator snapping turtles. Um, and this is obviously a rather large alligator snapping turtle. We call them ASTs for short, um, that we have behind the scenes. This was, again, our cooperation with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and Florida Fish and Wildlife. These animals were confiscated, um, and so they were brought to us to care for them so that we could potentially release them. And you see that this particular one has um, its uh, mouth open. They, you don't want to have your hand near that. No, you really don't. <laughs> you really don't. And, and we want to say thank you to Doug Holmes, who's the herpetologist, uh, who was the one holding up yeah. the snapping turtle. I don't <laughs> think I would be doing that. Um, let's take a look at uh, the next uh, animal, the, the, all again on the endangered species list. This one is the red wolf. It's at the Miller Park Zoo. Uh, Eric, if you want to explain the red wolf to us, please. Yeah, red wolves are a... Uh, species of wolf that was historically found throughout the southeastern United States. Um, back in the uh, mid to late 70s, they found out there were only about 14 uh, purebred wolves left in the whole country. Uh, they're found only here in North America, only in the southeast U.S., so they brought all of them into captivity and started a breeding program to bolster their numbers. And they did such a good job that back in the late 80s, they decided there were enough they could start re-releasing them into their natural habitat. Was this in North Carolina? Yes, they, the spot they chose was the Alligator River uh, National Wildlife Refuge, just a little bit west of the Outer Banks in North Carolina. And they chose that spot because it was a fairly large uh, wildlife refuge and there were no coyotes at the time. Red wolves will interbreed with coyotes if they feel they need to. So without that influence, they are. So, so is there a way to measure the success of that reintroduction? Well, uh, at one point there were 120 wild wolves. Uh, some of those had been released and some of those had been bred in the wild. So uh, it was on its way to being uh, very successful. Uh, unfortunately, uh, their numbers have dropped in recent years. Um, the state of North Carolina started to allow nighttime coyote hunting and so Anybody who thought the wolves were a coyote or didn't want wolves on their property and could claim they thought they were a coyote um, could shoot them without any sort of penalty. And uh, then at the same time, the uh, Fish and Wildlife stopped the reintroduction program, so the numbers have dropped. Uh, luckily, in the past few years, uh, we've started reintroducing them again. All of the uh, adult wolves have bright orange collars, so they're distinguishable from coyotes. And the, luckily, the past two years, we've had uh, uh, wild pups born. So the program is, is back on its feet, and it's going to be doing better. Before we go to the next video, Dawn, mm -hmm. Eric was talking about reintroducing animals to the wild. Yes. I want to make it clear that all the animals we are seeing, you did not get these from the wild. No, that the AST that we just saw was a confiscation. So this was it, this 
was just an opportunity for us to work with law enforcement and give this animal a home. But yes, most animals that we have at the zoo, if not all of them, were born in captivity or in human care. And the, the purpose behind that is you don't want to be taking animals from the wild. That's where they belong if they were born there. Correct. I mean, there are, um, like Don said, there are exceptions, but uh, we don't want to make the extinction problem worse. We don't want to be taking animals from the wild that are endangered or could be endangered at some point and cause them to go extinct. Let's go to the Peoria Zoo again, and this time we're going to look at giraffes, and I want to point out uh, that uh, the traditional way of looking at species of giraffes, there are eight mm -hmm. species. We're looking at a... Reticulated giraffe. A reticulated? Mm -hmm. Yes, this happens to be Taji. This is our adult male. Um, so at Peoria Zoo, we have reticulated giraffes. And as we kind of touched on with AZA, we have to manage these um, populations of animals depending on how much space we have in the zoo and in all of AZA zoos. And so reticulated giraffes are the largest population. There are, of course, Maasai giraffes. Um, and as we touched on a little bit earlier, they look completely different, come from different regions. And we manage them all as separate populations to keep their genetics as diverse as possible, but as closely related to their wild counterparts as possible. And of the eight, there are three that are endangered, mm -hmm. uh, the Maasai, the reticulated, and the Nubian. Correct. But real briefly, once again, here we go with technical terms, but can you explain, really we're starting to change our view of how many species of giraffes there are? Yeah, the, the latest studies, because they're doing a lot of work, genetic work um, and research, and they've realized probably they can categorize them into four different species. That's, that's the latest from IUCN, which is the the International Union for Conservation. Um, so they are looking at genetics constantly and grouping them in different ways. One of the issues that we have is that uh, there's habitat loss. There's, um, in the case of turtles, cars driving over them on roadways. Um, there's something called fragmentation. What is fragmentation? Fragmentation is where the natural habitat the natural range of an animal is uh, chopped into smaller and smaller pieces through human development. Um, so if you think of like a, a huge forest that an animal would want to live in, if you take part of that forest away, uh, there may not be enough room to um, find food in that forest. And so they'd have to go someplace else. Or if all of the fragments keep shrinking, there's just no place to live anymore. There's not, not enough food, there's not enough cover, and so they come into contact with humans or they, or they starve to death or something like that. And the expansion of um, the slash and burn techniques for agriculture, to, for palm oil in, in Indonesia, etc. cetera, um, there are any number of issues, many of them due to humans. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, those species who are mo very mobile species who need corridors to go from one wetland to another wetland, it's very difficult for them as these habitats are fragmented, it's very difficult for them to move from place to place safely. Um, certainly you, s you hear of turtles, especially breeding females, crossing the road, getting hit by cars, um, just trying to get from one wetland space or one habitat to another habitat, which is their nature to do. And there, of course, is illegal trade. Some people, snapping turtles, by the way, are ones that people actually have as pets, and I don't know why they would want to do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you have an example of uh, a, a red panda, I believe this is. Yeah. And so This is the fur from a red panda. So this is the fur from a red panda that would have died of natural causes in a zoo. Um, it's because it's part of an endangered species, it would be illegal for someone to own, but we have special permission from the government to have this and use it as an educational device. But red pandas live in the Himalayas, Nepal and China and Tibet and places like that. And uh, habitat loss is definitely part of their um, issue, but also poaching. You can see this is there um, from a nice warm environment, so this fur is very thick 
Um, it'll keep you nice and warm. N nice cold environment. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also very beautiful. I mean, they're very beautiful animals. And uh, some people like to translate that into making them into fur coats or, in this case, possibly hats. Um, so um, that's another reason that an animal would be in danger just and let's take a look at a couple of the red pandas uh, sure. that are at the Miller Park Zoo. And we should point out that uh, this is, again, an endangered species. Correct. Yeah, these are our two, uh, China and Burma, and they were born in 2019 at our zoo. Uh, they had a sibling who has since moved on to another zoo. Uh, like we've talked about, managed population. We've sent one of the siblings on to... Be, go to another zoo and possibly be a breeder at some point. So th 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 this is male and female? It's a brother-sister pair, yes. Okay, so, so you would not breed these two? No, these actually, we had to separate these two from uh, February through May because that is the breeding season. And when you put animals in an unnatural situation, um, they have a drive to reproduce. That's their goal in life is to reproduce. And so um, siblings, um, um, parents, and an offspring will breed with each other if they don't have another opportunity. They're very so. agile. They've got claws that, that they, by the way, uh, they actually were walking across the top of the cage, and I don't mean on top, but they were holding on underneath. Yeah, yeah, they, they will um, hook their claws and hang on top and walk um, Spider-Man style upside down across the top of the roof of the cage. They're very agile climbers. They eat bamboo, so they need to be up in the tops of the trees and the tops of the bamboo forest to get their food. And, and I noticed that there's a mist that is spraying on, it, it, you might be able to see a little bit of the mist there as, as it goes Yeah, it's by. coming across. And why is that? Uh, again, these are uh, cold weather animals. They live up in the, you know, the Himalayas where it's always cold. It never gets into the 80s. And so uh, when you can Todd were there at the zoo the other day, it was fairly warm. So we put a mist on them to keep them mm -hmm. cool. So uh, let's, before we go to the next video, we're going to show lemurs. And I want to explain that lemurs, there's maybe close to 100 uh, species of Correct. lemurs, mm -hmm. but they're all on the island of Madagascar? That's true. And they are all endangered, and all lemurs have been endangered since 1970. All, all species? All species of lemurs. Mm -hmm. And the island is off the east coast of Africa. It's, it's the fourth largest island, but still there's a hundred different species on this yes. island. Yes, amazing. And so let's, we're going to show you lemurs at Peoria and then at Miller Park Zoo. This is the ring-tailed lemur at Peoria Zoo. And explain what was happening, that they were so cleaning the, the it, normal... These are our two... Females, we have three lemurs um, in there together, and it's one male and two females. And this is our holding space right now. And so my guess is the keeper was working in their main exhibit. Um, and I, I happen to know that day they got a brand new enrichment item, which is this big like sleeping shack that he was putting <laughs> in the enclosure for them. Um, so this is, we actually do training behind the scenes and this is the space we do training behind the scenes so animals are weighed here um, and they do shift into the space as routine and you can breed these are, there, are they related um, it, this particular group is not slated to be bred um, and the reason we have the two females and the one male is for companionship and so it's really what's best for the lemur lemurs need lemurs um, and so we have our two females are on contraceptives, um, which, as you said, when you put animals at the zoo in a setting and you need them not to breed, we have several, several different ways that we contracept, um, sometimes males, sometimes females. It really just depends on the species. And that brings up the question of veterinarians. Yes. You, you have veterinarians that um, work with all the different species. Um, contraception wasn't one of the, one of the ideas that I thought about. But, <laughs> yeah. um, so is that that's true at Miller Park also? Yes, actually we share the same veterinarian. We, we both do. use the University of Illinois uh, Wildlife Veterinary Services. Um, they come out uh, at least once a week mm -hmm. and uh, anytime we have an emergency we can bring our animals to them. So it's not, we don't just wait until they come up, but 
um, and, and they're excellent. They have so much knowledge and they end up being um, almost holistic, um, I don't want to say life coaches, <laughs> but they do veterinary care. Um, they help us with our um, nutrition. Um, if we have problems with uh, housing or something like that, they, they'll help with that. There's, um, there's just a wealth of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, of, of the nearly 100 species of lemurs on Madagascar, red-ruffed lemurs are critically endangered right. now. Potentially less than a thousand of them in the wild. Uh, this is our family group. So it's a mom and dad and um, an offspring uh, from a couple years ago and then another offspring from a few years later. And they, um, we did breed them, uh, but we have been contracepting them the past few years. So part of that managed population is sometimes we want babies and sometimes we don't. So we have to prevent them from having more. Um, these four get along pretty good, but you start having too many in a group, it can um, be and difficult. This is one of the largest lemurs of all of them. Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and Madagascar is, is just a, a desperately poor country. Um, and so a lot of the uh, folks who live there uh, will do whatever they need to to survive. So if that includes cutting down the forest to um, plant crops or um, cutting down the trees for wood to make houses or something like that. And so that makes the plight of all these lemurs just that much more difficult. Let's uh, turn next to the Peoria Zoo and we're going to take a look at the spotted turtle. Before mm -hmm. we show that, I, I want to mention that there are a lot of reasons why animals become listed on the endangered species list. Yes. But in this particular case, it's automobiles. Yes, yes. As, as we were talking, their habitat is severely fragmented, very small, small spaces for these turtles to exist um, in the West, certainly in Illinois, in northern Illinois. Um, and they, they travel from place to place. They need clear, clean water and wetlands. And um, when they're traveling, they get hit by cars. Oh, love this guy. Um, as you can see, they, these guys are nicknamed the polka dot turtle. Um, <laughs> they can live to be very, very old, over 100. And uh, the older they get, the less spots they have. So you can actually end up seeing a, an adult male with hardly any spots at all, or spotless male, you should say. <laughs> and th this is the only species in this particular uh, genus? Correct. Uh, I, I think it's called the, the clemus? Yes. The clemus. <laughs> I'm, I'm going back to my bio biology days <laughs> in college. I, they're, they're the spots, so this isn't an older no. spotted turtle. No, we, we bred these guys. Um, a couple years ago, and so this actually, I think, is probably one of the one of the animals that had been born at our zoo. And they're native to northeastern U.S. Yes, Canada. Yeah, so there are some in Illinois. There are pockets in Illinois, um, and so they are an Illinois endangered species as well as being a, a federally listed endangered species. And uh, these are just seven of the animals that we were able to uh, get video of. There are many other endangered species, including at Miller Park, the snow leopard. Yes, we, uh, we have uh, two snow leopards right now. We used to be the, uh, our, our former director used to be the head of the SSP for the snow leopards. And we've had uh, multiple litters there. Um, they're uh, a cat from, uh, again, like the Himalayas and, and that region. So cold weather, they love to be outside all winter long. If you come to the zoo in February, they're probably outside love and life at that point in time. And over at the Peoria Zoo, <laughs> spider monkeys mm -hmm. are endangered. Yeah, and if, you, if you've if you been to Peoria Zoo, we've had the same resident spider monkeys there for, I've been at the zoo for 30 years. They were there before I was there. Butch is our eldest, he's over 50. Um, so we, they've been there forever. Um, I think people actually recognize them. We know they recognize the visitors. And, and golden frogs, you have golden frogs at both zoos, is that correct? Correct. Not well, currently, but we will but have some more. You will yes. have some more, and they are extinct in the wild, is that correct? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So it's critical now that the zoos serve a purpose in maintaining this particular species. Without zoos, the golden frogs would have gone extinct. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's very clear that it was one or two zoos that went out and collected some, 
before they could go extinct. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is particularly important to introduce young people to animals in regard to the possibility of extinction? Yes, I think, I think just connecting, connecting the kids with the animals and their plight is what's important. And with that, our half hour has expired. We appreciate your conversation. Don Peatfish, who is the curator, the, the curator of collections at the Peoria That's Zoo, correct. and the keeper, <laughs> <laughs> the keeper at Miller Park Zoo in Bloomington, Eric Hainanen. Thank you so much for being with us on Ad Issue. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate your being with us on Ad Issue. We hope you join us next time for another edition when we're going to be talking about newspaper deserts. One-fifth of Americans live in areas where there is no newspaper. We'll talk about that next time.